Okay, next we have uh, Robert Gowley from JPL. He's a member of the technical staff of the flight systems section. Uh, he's uh, worked on uh, Deep Space One, and I presume on two, three, four as well, or such? Not yet. Oh, not? Okay. Up to eight. Deep Space Eight is the last one. Okay, so we'll let uh, Bruce, or rather uh, Robert, come up and uh, start his presentation for us. Okay, I'm going to be tethered here on one end and tethered on the other, so I think my range of motion is going to be about this far. Uh, there is gigabits and gigabits of data I need to get through in a very short amount of time. I'm going to try to increase my clock speed beyond my usual rate to somewhere on the order of 10 or 20 millisieverts. We'll see how I do. <laughs> Deep breath. Well, uh, can somebody reach over and try to advance the slide tray a little bit here? It's uh, going to be a somewhat less interesting lecture without the visuals. <laughs> Well, let me begin by saying that our journey begins in a NASA laboratory long ago and far away at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, we built a spacecraft called Galileo. It began its development back in 1977, uh, suffered a number of budgetary setbacks that extended the mission, uh, technical problems with the shuttle, with the inertial upper stage. It was finally launched in 1989. Uh, Bruce, uh, could I ask you to be the slide advancer and maybe this will go a little more efficiently? Yeah. <laughs> and we have the next slide, please. Uh, can we go back one slide? <laughs> yes, uh, Galileo launched out of the space shuttle in, in October of 1989. I showed this in particular because one of the astronauts on board that mission, SPS-34, was Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, who many of you heard speak the other night. Uh, we are most grateful to him. He delivered Galileo uh, well and safely on its way to Jupiter. Next slide, please. We took a rather long loping path around the inner solar system because we needed the gravitational assist of the Earth and Venus in order to get it on its way. Uh, these, this picture was taken during the second Earth flyby in 1992, which gave us a view of the Earth and Moon very much like you saw in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Next slide, please. Also along the way, we made some close passes past a couple of asteroids. Uh, this one in particular is particularly interesting. This shows the asteroid Ida with a hitherto unknown companion named Dactyl. I remember when this picture was first taken, there was kind of a, a buzz around the science for uh, some of the some of the instrument people didn't dare believe that uh, their camera could actually have caught something and were kind of keeping kind of quiet until the they noticed that the infrared team was noticing a funny spot on their pictures and put the two together and said, yeah, I think this is probably real. And so this small asteroid, which has a satellite around it, uh, completely changed the outlook on how such bodies exist in the solar system. Previously, satellites around asteroids were considered to be a possible but very improbable set of occurrences. And as soon as this picture was published, I read the same technical paper say, we now expect that satellites around asteroids are relatively commonplace. So it's amazing what one bit of data can provide. Next slide, please. Uh, Galileo had a somewhat uh, tumultuous journey on the way to Jupiter. This shows a cross-section of the spacecraft. And you'll note that the antenna on top there, which should open up like a nice big umbrella, is sort of canted and stuck on one side. Uh, that's because we experienced a spot of bother when we attempted to open it. Some of the ribs stuck to the top of the tower. And without that, our data rate went from 115,000 bits per second that we expected down to a capability around Jupiter in the tens of bits per second. Uh, this caused us a little bit of difficulty, but uh, through the efforts of the Deep Space Network and an excellent flight software team, we were able to reprogram Galileo to compress the data and send it back very efficiently so that we achieved most of the major science objectives with far fewer bits than we ever thought was going to be necessary or even possible. 
And furthermore, through the auspices of the Deep Space Network, virtually every listening station that was capable of gathering data was pulled into play so that we were able to draw heavily from the supply of data that Galileo was providing. Next slide, please. One of the major objectives of the Galileo mission was to obtain information about the Jovian atmosphere. It contained an atmospheric probe that plunged into the, the deep clouds of Jupiter and sent back about 70 minutes worth of atmospheric data, essentially an on-site weather report of what Jupiter is like. So in December 1995, we held our breaths, waited anxiously for a little bit of data, and finally got an indication that the data was on board and ready to be played back. Uh, we were feeling very gratified about that, and uh, uh, we think we are entitled to a little forgiveness for some of the problems that it experienced along the way. Next slide, please. And we got this from the highest source. Uh, this shows Pope John Paul II receiving a package of images and uh, scientific data from the Galileo spacecraft uh, a few years earlier. The astronomer Galileo had been officially pardoned by the Vatican, so by, I think, a long-standing uh, difficulty has finally been resolved, and this kind of crowns it to have a spacecraft named after Galileo be officially received. Next slide, please. But the major mission after the, the gathering the probe data is to collect data around Jupiter itself through flybys of its major satellites, EO, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. These are individual worlds, all their own. They are about the size of Earth's moon, each with their own fascinating history that we could get some tantalizing clues from, from the Voyager data. But with Galileo, we would be getting much closer, gather with data with much more sensitive instruments, and make a long, prolonged exposure. Voyager was just a quick flyby. Galileo would be going back again and again and again. And uh, through the offices of the Deep Space Network, we would be collecting some data, putting it onto a tape recorder, and trickling it back to Earth uh, so that every encounter gives us about one orbit's worth of data that we play back, and we're ready for the next one a couple of months later. Next slide, please. We got quite a tour of the Jovian system. On the left, you see satellite EO progressing to Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. This is shown in distance relative to the planet Jupiter. On the row below it, you see features on the order of 10 kilometers highest resolution, and below that, one kilometer resolution. We've gathered such data on every one of the satellites, and I'm going to say a little bit about each of them and give you a little bit of a Cook's tour of what it would be like to be around Jupiter and have those moons beneath you ready for prospecting. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows the surface of Callisto. It is the furthest from Jupiter and seems to be the least evolved of all of them. Uh, when you look at it, you basically see the scars from billions of years of asteroid impacts. And as near as can be told, there has been very little motion there to try to move things around. We don't see the sort of plate tectonics that we see on our own planet, for example. But it gives us, instead, a glimpse back to how many meteors have been falling throughout the history of the solar system. Next slide. And occasionally, we get some indications of some freak collisions. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, remember the cometary impact of Shoemaker-Levy 9 back in 1994, where a string of cometary particles, or particles, uh, pretty large chunks hit Jupiter in a stream. Well, we have evidence here that something similar to that happened on Callisto, where you just see a string of craters lined up like beads in a string right in a row. So the speculation is either it was a string or something akin to a single body hopping across the surface. This was a rather spectacular find and uh, looks well in our catalog. Next slide. Now, Callisto, as I've indicated, had every indication of being a rather cold and uninteresting world. At least that's what you can tell from the visual images. We have other instruments on board Galileo. 
uh, we have instruments to study the fields and particles, and in particular the magnetic fields that we experience around the satellites. The way the satellite interacts with the intense magnetic fields around Jupiter gives you some indication what's inside. Our expectations were that we would see pretty much not much of anything. And yet, upon by Callisto, we saw some evidence of magnetic fields of a character that requires some kind of conductive ingredient in it that is most easily explained by liquid salt water. This is still very speculative, but to realize that a body that appeared to be as dull and lifeless as Callisto should show some signs of some internal activity kind of wets our whistle and says, you know, there could be some other things we just have to scrape a little deeper to see. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows the satellite Ganymede. Ganymede is a little closer into Jupiter, and you can see a little more dynamic activity. There's some variety on this satellite. Things have been slowly reworked. Next slide. The, the image on the left shows the section of Ganymede that was taken by Voyager, and on the right, the same area taken by Galileo. On Galileo, you can actually see features on the orders of hundreds of, of meters wide. And that feature that you see on the left would be very hard to interpret, but here you can see evidence of ice flows and an actual reworking of the surface. Uh, I failed to mention that uh, most of the Jovian satellites, especially Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, are largely water ice with some rocky material in between. This shows some jagged ice flows going across Ganymede that are perhaps billions of years old, but nonetheless, at one time, we're moving things about. Next slide. On some of the darker areas, we show evidence of rocky material that uh, has been spewed up and uh, largely covered with with debris from meteoroid impacts. The surface on, around it, the wider areas, have been reworked by internal processes. Next slide. We took quite a few images of Ganymede. In fact, we were even able to get some stereo images. These show, uh, in slightly exaggerated form, ice cliffs around Ganymede of hundreds of meters. If I had access to a video, I would be able to show an uh, imaginary ride across the surface. By the by, all the pictures I'm showing you here are available through our website, www.jpl.nasa.gov. In fact, on the chair by the door, there's a little business card giving our website address. So there's all this and quite a bit more than you can explore in, on your own time when you get home. Next slide. And again, through the auspices of the magnetometer, we're able to tell that Ganymede had a pretty significant internal magnetic field, one that is best explained by an a magnetic iron core, the sort of thing that you just don't expect to find in a satellite, at least we didn't think so up till now. This is something much more like our own Earth and suggests some processes could have been on board that uh, greatly affected its evolution differently than other satellites in the Jovian system. Uh, it, there is no evidence thus far that Ganymede has evidence of liquid water underneath its surface. However, next slide please. Europa has been a continuing series of surprises. We had targeted Europa for our extended mission. Uh, the money for Galileo had officially run out in 1997, and by a little reworking, we came up with a plan, concentrating on exploring this satellite in particular and gathering information about its surface because it is polished smooth and shows evidence of heavy, heavy ice deposits. And there was even the suggestion of recent liquid water underneath the surface, even, even before Galileo came by, there was heavy speculation. Uh, we have found evidence that makes that case much, much more compelling. Next slide. Looking across the surface, you can see the billiard ball uh, appearance. This shows some, some uh, rocky clefts in between the ice fields that appear to be rocky material bubbled up from the surface where the ice plates have separated. This is, an ex this is a stretched visual image in order to bring out the detail. Uh, the blue are the ice and the, and the dark red are the rocky material that seems to have erupted from the surface. 
and eruptions imply some kind of liquid matter sometime in its evolution. Next slide. Now the thing that got people's attention were seeing not just large sheets moving, but chunks. On the right hand side, you can see how giant ice rafts seem to have broken off and resemble the ice flows that you see of glaciers moving out into to the bay. And at some time in the past, age is a little hard to tell, at some time in the past, those ice flows had broken off and settled in place, leaving evidence that things were moving over some kind of liquid surface. To give you a sense of scale, on the left-hand side, we show San Francisco Bay. So we we're talking about some ice flows many times the size of Alcatraz Island that you see in the middle of the picture on the left. Next slide. But the most tantalizing pictures are the ones that seem to show more recent activity. Our clock for estimating how old things are are meteor impacts. Uh, Callisto uh, appears to have been undistinguished, just keeps gathering pock after pock after pock as meteors hit. Europa here has a nice little soft spot there with a meteor right in the middle. Perhaps some liquid eruption in the recent past? Oh, thank you. Actually, I have this tool and I'm not using it. This area right here suggests more recent information. And sure enough, when the magnetometer's data came in, there was a strong signature of some sort of salt water underneath the surface. All this is still somewhat speculative, but it is explained best by having some liquid underneath the surface, perhaps uh, a few kilometers underneath, perhaps within the capability that a probe could go beneath the surface and start exploring down there. Because for there to be liquid water, there is almost certainly some sort of internal heating mechanism. When we're, and given water and the possibility of some organic material, uh, there's even speculation that there might be a few green growing things underneath there like we found at the bottom of our oceans. At least some people are have to play that up and uh, encourage us to look a little further. Next slide, please. But by far the most dynamic object in the Jovian system is EO. This has been Nick sometimes nicknamed the pizza photograph. EO is a highly volcanic surface. It has reworked itself considerably just in the 20 years between Galileo's encounter and Voyager about 20 years previously. On the surface, you see the, the bright orange, which in this somewhat highlighted picture is evidence of sulfuric eruptions, and the little dark spots are the caldera of the eruptions. Next slide, please. EO is so active that even in pitch blackness, like the picture on the left, which was taken when it was in Jupiter's shadow, it casts enough internal light from the powerful electromagnetic forces that go on. EO is deep inside Jupiter's magnetosphere. And if you think about it, when you have a very powerful magnetic field and you're moving a, even a slightly conductive body through it, that's a gigantic electric motor and creating internal heating that is driving the system here to produce a lot of heat. So this is literally an engine of Jupiter that's driving uh, these volcanic eruptions. And each of these spots is a volcano in some state of eruption. Next slide. And this shows one of those eruptions. We don't have to look very hard. We generally find them when we look. And this is tens of kilometers high showing a sulfury plume coming up. And the ionization with the Jovian atmosphere gives it this, this bright blue sheen against the orange of the EO satellite. Next slide. We haven't just been concentrating on the satellites. There is the atmosphere of Jupiter below that has quite a bit of activity. We have, we have taken a few time-lapse photographs that show the progression of cloud patterns on the surface. This, of course, is the great red spot. If you were to put Earth alongside here, you would be able to fit one, two, and three straight across. This Jovian system, this red spot, has been active 
ever since telescopes were first pointed at Jupiter, and that was over 400 years ago, and this storm shows no sign of dissipating. Next slide. Something that brought back a lot of memories for me were these pictures of the innermost satellites of Jupiter, Amalthea, Phoebe, Adrastea, and Metis. Amalthea was discovered in the 1890s, whereas Phoebe, Adrastea, and Metis were discovered by Voyager during its encounter in the late 70s. The reason this brings back a lot of nostalgic memories is that uh, an essay I read by Isaac Asimov back when I was still a fresh-faced high school kid, wanting, dreaming, praying to work in space someday, he wrote an article called Catskills in the Sky, describing what it would be like to visit various spots in the solar system and the kind of view you would get. And far and away, uh, the premier spot was Amalthea, because beneath there you would see the vast clouds of Jupiter filling up almost the entire sky, and you would have that view almost continuously and see roiling clouds beneath and thunderbolts in the dark sky. He thought that would be a terrific place to put a, a sky dome with a casino. In fact, uh, I, I could almost scout a few sites there on that surface. Um, the one problem that he didn't speak of is that Amalthea and all the rest are deep, deep inside the radiation belt, and unprotected human flesh takes very badly to radiation. In fact, we're already seeing some effects on Galileo that appear to be radiation damages of sensitive components that bit by bit are aging our electronics to the point where we're going to have to be a little careful as we get in closer. Next slide. One feature that wasn't recognized around Jupiter until Voyager is that it has a ring, not quite like Saturn, it's not as prominent, but with enough magnification, you can see a thin line right across the edge. And each of these are being maintained by the innermost satellites that seem to be gathering material together. Paradoxically, Galileo discovered a new set of ring material, very diffuse around the planet, that seems to be rotating in exactly the opposite direction from all the rest. And people are still kind of scratching their heads how everything else could seem to favor a counterclockwise rotation, and this one has to be nonconformist, and these ring particles go in the opposite, so many, many riddles to be unraveled. Next slide. We are now in the middle of the latter part of the Europa Extended Mission, otherwise called GEM. We are pulling ourselves now in closer and closer back to Jupiter in order to go close to EO again. Our next encounter will be in late June. It will be another close flyby of Callisto, and that will help to drive the orbit of Galileo in a little closer each time until later this year we'll make some close flybys of EO. Next slide. And we expect that this will give us some of the most dramatic pictures yet. Uh, the pictures I showed of EO were generally done from hundreds of thousands of kilometers away, unlike all the other satellites that we've been collecting a lot of data from hundreds of kilometers. This is because EO is, again, deep in the Jovian belt. We don't want to go there until we are pretty well near the end of the mission and try to save the best for last. Otherwise, we might lose some terrific scientific opportunities elsewhere. But the time has now come to pull in close and gather data, close-up data, on one of the most active bodies in the solar system. Now, I have given you but a thumbnail. <clears throat> I'm going to make it. I have given you but a thumbnail sketch of the scientific discoveries that Galileo has made. I am reminded of a fountain in Los Angeles dedicated around the turn of the century by William Mulholland, who brought water to the city of Los Angeles. And just like Bruce is demonstrating here. And at the dedication, Mulholland turned on the fountain and said, here it is, take it. After a long, arduous journey, Galileo can show you what marvelous things there are around Jupiter. There are, there's water, minerals, 
high source of energy. And I am probably not the person that's going to build and work with them. But I hope some of you around here, especially the younger ones, may make that dream possible. So here it is. Come and get it. Next slide, please. And where you go from there is up to you. We have a few minutes, I think, for questions back there. What do you think uh, the popular scientific theory is explaining the continuous storm in the spot over all these centuries? Uh, the question was, what is the popular theory about the uh, continuous red spot around Jupiter? Uh, I've, I've read some articles suggesting that the, the nature of Jupiter is that sometimes a pattern like this could turn out to be very stable. They've actually been able to replicate some experiments on the Earth with similar fields where if you have a turbulent field, sometimes a pattern like this will just linger and linger and linger and linger. Uh, fluid flow can be a very complicated problem, especially when you've got uh, such extremes of temperature and pressure that uh, work on this. And occasionally, in chaos theory, you minus, manage to find a stable pattern in a, semi, in a seemingly turbulent world. So, I don't know if I can answer that in a simple way, but uh, there is some evidence on the Earth that say sometimes it can happen. Over here. Uh, the question was, when we bring the orbit of Galileo in closer, we get some better images of the moonlets. Uh, the answer is probably not. We are concentrating our picture budget on EO because uh, there is only a certain amount of data capacity we can put on the tape recorder at any one time, and, and we're concentrating on the main targets. I honestly don't know whether any of the moonlets are even planned for examination at these closer flybys. How about this side of the room, over here? Yeah, question. You had mentioned the radiation issue, the radiation environment. And what is the radiation environment at Europa? Could critters survive given the radiation environment at that location? Uh, the question was, what is the radiation environment around Europa? Could critters, meaning some life form, survive? Uh, the answer to that is that the radiation environment around Europa is pretty intense. It would be unfriendly for human beings. They would need to be fairly heavily shielded. But we know on the Earth that some bacteria are able to not only live but thrive in high radiation environments. I remember reading about uh, some bacteria that were discovered living quite comfortably uh, down in the heavy water vats around nuclear reactors. Okay. So the evidence suggests that some forms of life are hardy enough. And bear in mind that the bacteria that hypothetically live beneath miles of ice would be well protected. Over here. What do you think the best guess is currently of the depth of the ice on Europa? The question is, what is the best guess of the depth of the ice on Europa? Speculation, we, we still haven't done core samples to really answer that, are that the ice is probably on the order of a few kilometers, certainly something that uh, any oil well driller could go through. The challenge will be for future missions to find ways to go through the surface. And there's been some talk about having uh, radioisotope probes that could actually melt their way down and through and carry a little extension cord showing what they're seeing. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? OK, how about two more questions? The question is, how much propellant is left? Galileo launched with 955 kilograms of rocket fuel, and it used most of it, over two-thirds, getting into orbit around Jupiter. It currently has a very healthy supply. I think the last I heard was still about 80 or 90 kilograms. With gravitational assists, we've had to use very little. There's, it does not appear to be that fuel is the limiting factor. One last question. Yes, sir. How do you plan to terminate Galileo? <sighs> the question is, how do we plan to terminate Galileo? Well, I plan to be very sad. There is, there has been discussion 
about what happens after the, Gal the Galileo extended the Europa mission. After we've gone past EO a couple times, whether we could afford to put Galileo into kind of a hibernation mode and just collect fields of particles data as long as it lasts. It's going to take a beating going into EO again, so it's by no means a lead pipe cinch that it's going to be healthy coming out. And they're trying to trip lightly on this. Some have suggested that it would be marvelous if Galileo could collect some data as Cassini is also flying by and get some useful observations. I don't know if uh, funding for that has been approved, and remember, you did not hear it from me. <laughs> I thank you very much.